When you think of the samurai, there are probably a few different things that come to mind. Discipline, the shogunate, the Bushido code, and so on. One of the things that you probably don't think of though is female samurai. In basically every form of media, the samurai have been portrayed as an all-male class. But would you believe if I told you that for hundreds of years, women of the Bushi class, the samurai class, also fought alongside the men? Now, the format of this video is going to have to be a little different from my standard format. I normally talk about individual people, but the Onabagaisha is an entire class that spanned hundreds of years. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview, and then I'll tell the stories of some of the more renowned Onabagaisha. Sound good? Good. Before the samurai class was a thing, Japan was already home to formidable warriors who used swords and spears. In particular, women were trained in using the naginata, kaiken, and tando jutsu, traditional Japanese knife fighting. Also, before we go any further, I'd just like to say that I know I'm going to horribly mispronounce everything Japanese in this video, so I'm not even going to try, I'm just going to pronounce it how it looks or how I think it is pronounced. Anyway. Uh, this training was particularly prevalent in communities that had a small number of able-bodied men, as it granted protection in their absence. The most famous female fighter from this time, before the formal creation of the samurai or onabagaisha, is Empress Jinju, possibly the most famous onabagaisha in Japanese history. But more on her later. Later, the Genpai War, from 1180 to 1185, during the Kamakura period, saw two prominent onabagaisha, for context, the Genpai War was a war between two very powerful Japanese clans, the Taira and Minamoto. The first of these Onabagaisha is Tomoe Gozen, who was a servant of the leader of the Minamoto clan, Minamoto no Yoshinaka. She saw fairly extensive combat, although is best known for her participation in the Battle of Awazu in 1184. The Tale of the Haiki, written a couple hundred years after she died, has a lengthy description on her. Tomoe was especially beautiful, with white skin, long hair, and showing features. She was also a remarkably strong archer, and as a swordswoman, she was a warrior worth a thousand, ready to confront a demon or a god, mounted or on foot. She handled unbroken horses with superb skill. She rode unscathed down perilous descents. Whenever a battle was imminent, Yoshinaka sent her out as his first captain, equipped with strong armor, an oversized sword, and a mighty bow, and she performed more deeds of valor than any of his other warriors. The other Onabagaisha of the Genpai War was Hangaku Gozen, who served the Taira clan and was actually a general during the war. Also known as Lady Hangaku, she is mainly known for her defense of Fort Tosakayama. She actually saw very little military action and mainly serves as a symbol that during this period in Japanese history, the status of men and women in Japanese society was much more equal than it would become. In fact, let's talk about that for a minute. Before the Meiji Restoration of 1868, it wasn't uncommon for Japan to be ruled by empresses rather than an emperor. In fact, there are eight recorded empresses ruling instead of an emperor. And while it was rare for women to become the legally recognised leader of their tribal clan, several women did become the de facto ruler of their respective power structures. There is also an interesting passage from the Journal of Chancellor Toin Kinkata. He mentions a predominantly female cavalry, but fails to give us any further explanation. He does mention that these female cavalry are from western Japan, which may imply that in the western portions of Japan, far from the big cities, it was much more common for women to participate in battles. In fact, female cavalry seems to have been a common thing in Japanese warfare, as there are reports from the Sengoku period, 1467-1600, of female cavalry. Anyway, after the Genpai War, the Kamakura Shogunate was established, and after the Shogun Minamoto no Yoritomo died, his wife, Hojo Masako, took over as regent and became the first Onabagaisha to be a prominent figure in politics. It's through her and the efforts of her puppets that granted women equal rights of inheritance with fraternal kin. There were also new laws that gave Japanese women the ability to control finances, bequeath property, maintain their homes, manage servants, and raise their children with a proper samurai upbringing. There's also the expectation that Japanese women were to defend their homes in times of war. The Sengoku period also saw several powerful and memorable onabagaisha. The first of note is Hino Tomiko, whose actions caused the Onin War and the beginning of the Sengoku period. Basically, in 1460, the shogun Ashikaga Yoshimasa abdicated in favour of his younger brother Ashikaga Yoshimi. Hino Tomiko, the wife of the now abdicated shogun, hated this decision as she wanted the shogunate to go to her unborn son, 
which would give her immense power as regent until her son became old enough to rule. She secured the support of several leaders of powerful clans and started the Onin War against her husband. Later in the Sengoku period, there were several instances of women of both noble clans and peasant status seeing action. In the case of peasant women, the Iko Iki, Iko Shu, and Saika Iki sects all had female members who went to the battlefield. If you want to know what these sects are, Iko Iki are rebellious peasants who oppose the rule of the daimyos, the Iko Shu is mainly a militant branch of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, Saika Iki were a mercenary group formed by members of both the nobility and peasantry. Around the same time as these groups were active, there was also Ichikawa no Sabon, the wife of a Mori family retainer. In 1569, she assumed responsibility for the defence of Konamine Castle with her armed ladies-in-waiting. A few years later, in 1591, several women defended Kunahe Castle during the Kunahe Rebellion, persisting even after the castle caught fire. And in 1614, Nyodo Dono, who had once been a concubine of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, led a rebellion against the Tokugawa shogunate. She and her son would commit suicide a year later in Osaka Castle as it burned down. Remember earlier when I said there were several accounts of women on the battlefield during the Sengoku period? Well, it's time to talk about them. There's the case of Murin, who inspired the people to fight against 3,000 Shimazu soldiers, Kahime, who fought against the Toyotomi in the 1590 siege of Oshi, Onamahime, who became the representative leader of the Nikaido clan and fought in several battles against her nephew, Date Yusamune, Akai Teruko, who was famous for fighting until she was 76 and became known as the strongest woman in the Warring States period and the Joan of Arc of Japan. Even as late as the 16th century, there were military units that consisted only of women. The main examples of this were Akita Sen, who led a Japanese firearm unit of 200 women in the Battle of Shizukatake, and the Battle of Komaki Nagakute. Atazo Nokata fought alongside 18 other armed women against Tokugawa Iyasu. Ono Tsuruhime led 34 women in a suicidal charge against the Mori army. Takibana Ginchio, the leader of the Takibana clan, fought with her female troops in the Kyushu campaign in 1586, and in the siege of Yanagawa in 1600, she organised female resistance of nuns against the advance of the Eastern army. During this time, there were also female ninjas, known as the Konoichi, whose main function was espionage, knowledge gathering, gaining trust, listening to conversations, and finding functions in enemy health services. But these aren't the focus of this video, so we'll move on. Archaeological digs also point to the fact that more women may have fought in battles and have been recorded in documents. For example, there were DNA tests on 105 bodies recovered from the Battle of Senbon Matsubora in 1580, and the tests reveal that 35 of them were women. Other excavations away from castles have been done, and the resulting studies have come to the conclusion that up to 30% of battle corpses away from castles were women an extremely high amount in comparison to their contemporaries in Europe and America. Unfortunately, during the Edo period, the status of the Onabagaisha diminished significantly. The influence of Edo Neo-Confucianism saw samurai become bureaucrats, and the women of the upper classes, who had once been the Onabagaisha, became political bargaining tools. Samurai women now had to be accompanied by a man, as they weren't permitted to travel alone, and they had to have specific permits in establishing their businesses. The start of the 17th century marked a significant transformation in the social acceptance of women. Women became viewed as solely childbearers, and it became inconceivable that a woman could be a fit companion for war, and the relationship between a husband and a wife was more similar to that of a lord and his vassal. That being said, the Onabagaisha hadn't vanished entirely. Female-led Kenjutsu schools were common, even though these were inherited patrilineally, and there were also a few isolated incidents of women still taking their place on the battlefield. In 1868, during the Battle of Aizu, Nakano Takido and her female corps joined another 3,000 samurai in battle against the onslaught of 20,000 warriors of the Imperial Japanese Army of the Ogaki Domain. In the same battle, there was also Yamamoto Yaiko, Masadaira Teru, and Yamakawa Futaba, who defended Aizawakamatsu Castle. Yamamoto Yaiko would also become one of the first leaders for women's rights in Japan. The last record of Onabagaisha taking part in a battle is actually the last battle of the samurai, the Satsuma Rebellion. Basically, during the Meiji period, the samurai revolted in 1877 over policies passed by the government that sought to create an army based on conscription rather than a dedicated warrior class. During the siege of the city of Kagoshima, several women are said to have fought in the battle, although their efforts were in vain as the rebellion was crushed and the Onabagaisha and samurai ceased to be. Alright, that's the general history of the Onabagaisha done, so now it's time to have a look at the full stories of some of the more well-known ones.
Empress Jinju is perhaps the first Onaba Geisha in Japanese history, although her story is very much tied in with mythology rather than real history. That being said, for the rest of this video I'm actually not going to focus on real history, and just focus on the stories. Records show that Jinju's birth name was Akinaga Terashi, and she was born around the year 169 AD. What's interesting is that she came from a distinguished line, as her mother, this, uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, I'm sorry, was a descendant of Amenohobiko, a legendary Korean prince. Regardless, at some point she married Terashi Nakahiki, who would go on to be Emperor Chua. Akinaga Terashi therefore became the Empress Consort until her husband died as a result of rebels in the year 200 AD. In response to this, Empress Jinju destroyed the rebels in a fit of rage and then led her people on a conquest of a promised land, which has been interpreted by many to be the Korean Peninsula, which took her three years before returning to Japan victorious. Frank Bindley, in his book A History of the Japanese People from the Earliest Times to the End of the Meiji Era, has a very lengthy passage on Empress Jinju, but describes her far better than I ever could, so here's the quote. His demise was carefully concealed, and the Empress, mustering the troops, took vengeance upon the Kamasu, a lady intelligent, shrewd, and with a countenance of such blooming loveliness that her father wondered at it. To this appreciation, her character must be added the attributes of boundless ambition and brave resourcefulness. The animals represent her as bent from the outset on the conquest of Korea, and as receiving the support and encouragement of Takenuchu no Sukune who had served her husband and his predecessor as Prime Minister. A military expedition overseas, led by a sovereign in person, had not been heard of since the days of Jimu, and to reconcile officials and troops to such an undertaking, the element of divine revelation had to be introduced. At every stage, signs of importance were vouchsafed by the guardian deities. By their intervention, the Empress was shown to be possessed of miraculous prowess, and at that instance, troops and ships assembled spontaneously. The Armada sailed under divine guidance, a gentle spirit protecting the Empress, and a warlike spirit leading the van of her forces. The god of the wind sent a strong breeze, the god of the sea ruled the waves favourably, all the great fishes accompanied the squadron, and an unprecedented tide bore the ships far inland. Fighting became unnecessary. The king of Shiraga did homage at once, and promised tribute and allegiance forever, and the other monarchs of the peninsula followed his example. In short, Korea was conquered, and incorporated with the dominions of Japan. I know that was a fairly lengthy quote, but I'd just like to take this chance to reiterate that Empress Jinju's story is a bit controversial, and is likely a mix of history and mythology, but leans more towards being a mythological story. After this invasion of Korea, Empress Jinju finally returned home, and officially ascended to the Chrysanthemum throne, and gave birth to a boy called Amato Wake. Empress Jinju ruled until her death in 269 at the age of 100. Tomoe Gozen is another potentially mythical figure, but let's have a look at her story. From the outset, she was closely linked to Minamoto no Yoshinaka, the leader of one of the main clans during the Genpai War, as her father, Nakahara Kanito, was Yoshinaka's foster father, having raised him since he was two, and her mother, Chizuru Gozen, was Yoshinaka's wet nurse. Two of Tomoe Gozen's elder brothers would also serve Yoshinaka as generals. In 1182, during the Genpai War, she commanded 300 samurai against 2,000 warriors of the rival Taira clan, and defeated them, and then joined up with Yoshinaka's force for the Battle of Yawazu. The battle, and Tomoe's participation, is covered in the tale of the Haiki. Under no Yachio Marashige, a man from the Musashi famed for his strength, rode up with 30 men. Tomoe charged, caught him in an iron grip, forced his head down to her pommel, kept it pinned there, twisted it round, cut it off and tossed it away. Surrounding Kiso with a mass of men, Ichijo went for his life and his head. Kiso's 300 and mid 6,000 slashed left, right, up, down, everywhere, meanwhile retreating till they broke out, just 50 now, cutting through all corners until they met a force of 2,000. They broke through that too, and further on, through four or 500, through two or three, through 140 or 50, then 100, each time at a cost until Kiso had only four left. This last remnant band of five still included Tomoe. Lord Kiso said to her, Go woman, go quickly, anywhere, far away. For myself I should die in battle, or if wounded, take my own life, and it must not be said that at the end I had a woman with me. She still did not go, but he kept pressing her until at last she replied, All I want is a worthy opponent, so that you can watch me fight my last fight. And that's all we have of the Battle of, of Zawu, at least where Tomoe is concerned. The rest of the story goes on to detail Lord Kiso's death, and Tomoe doesn't make another appearance.
Hankaku Gozen, if you remember, is the other noteworthy Onabagaisha who fought during the Genpai War, although she fought on the opposite side to Tomoe Gozen. Her date of birth is unknown, but she was the daughter of a samurai called Joe Sukikune and had several siblings. Her family, the Joe, were allies of the Taira clan, which dragged them into the Genpai War. The Taira, and by extension the Joe, lost the Genpai War in 1185, but Hangaku's story really takes off after the war. In 1201, Hangaku, along with her nephew and at least one of her siblings, raised an army to aid the Kenan uprising that was aimed at overthrowing the Kamakura shogunate. Hangaku and her sibling, Tsukunaga, took up defensive positions and a fort at Tasakiyama, but soon found themselves under attack. Hangaku had only 3,000 warriors to fend off the attacking force of 10,000. The defence is held until Hangaku was wounded and then captured, after which the defence of the fort crumbled. Hangaku was then taken to Kamakura, where she was presented to the Shogun, Minamoto no Yurao. It's here that she met a warrior of the Kai Genju clan, married with the Shogun's permission, and is said to have had one daughter. I'd just like to quickly add that the word Gozen isn't a name, it's a title that's usually translated to mean lady, although some samurai men also got this title. So Tomoe Gozen and Hangaku Gozen aren't related in any way, I thought I'd just clear that up. Mary Beard details Hangaku's story from the Battle of Tasakiyama Fort in 1201 and onwards in her book, The Force of Women in Japanese History, as follows. Hangaku was in high standing among her people because she was such a skilled archer, exceeding the art of her father and brothers as marksmen in shooting 100 arrows and hitting 100 times. During this battle in April 1201, dressed as a boy, Hangaku stood on the tower of the castle, and all those that came to attack her were shot down by her arrows, which pierced them either from their chests or their heads. The horses were killed, and their shields were broken into pieces from their arms. Finally, when the attackers went to the rear of the castle, aimed at her from this indefensible angle. His arrow penetrated her thigh, and when she was prostrate, she was seized. Before she was fully recovered, in June she was taken to Kamakura as a prisoner of war. On her arrival, Shogun Yuri at once summoned her to his presence. She appeared before him, fearless as a man and beautiful as a flower. On the following day, the Shogun heard through a maid that Yasari Yuchi Yoshito, one of his retainers, would like to take Angaku to his home if she were to be exiled. In explanation, this samurai said he wished to get a strong son to defend the Shogun. The Shogun replied, that woman is beautiful, but she has the woman's heart, consequently no attraction for men. Your desire is extraordinary. Nevertheless, the samurai's request was granted, and he took her to his abode. I only mentioned Muren briefly, so I'll forgive you for not remembering anything I told you about her. That being said, her actions are fairly influential, and she earned the title Garden of Sisaraki for her actions. This is her story. Muren's real name, origin, and year of death are unknown. Her father was Kyosuke Hayashi. The name Muren comes from her Dharma name, Muren Ni. For those who don't know, a Dharma name is a name you receive on being initiated as a Buddhist monastic. Muren married Yoshiaki Akiyoki, the leader of the Yoshiaka clan, but he was killed in 1578 during the Battle of Minokawa. This meant that their son, Yoshiaka Minamasu, would be the new head of the Yoshiaka clan but he was only 10 years old, so the role fell to Murin. She seems to have been highly capable in her administration of the castle she lived in, Surasaki Castle, but fate had other plans for Murin. In recent years, the Shimazu of Satsuma had had great success in spreading his influence, and in 1586 he moved to take three more fortresses, Funai Fortress, Usuki Fortress, and Surasaki Fortress. Murin decided to resist the Shimazu, despite the fact that her son had taken some soldiers to assist the defense of Usuki Castle, and as 3,000 defenders began to siege her castle in December 1585, Muren began to strengthen her defences. She strengthened the small fortress by digging moats, placing fences and boards as walls, digging pitfalls around the castle that were then hidden by grass. Ropes of bells were placed in the nearby forest to one of approaching foes, and along the expected route of attack, a combination of walls and pits were placed. The Muren gathered the local residents, armed them, and waited for the Shimazu. As the Shimazu settled in around the castle, Muren appeared on the walls dressed in full armour and carried a naginata, accompanied with a small number of soldiers, farmers and maids. The three generals leading the Shimazu forces attempted negotiations, offering her a substantial amount of gold and silver if she surrendered the castle, but she made it clear that she would defend the castle to the death. During the siege, the Shimazu made many assaults, but the traps caused them to retreat several times while Muren led a firearm unit on the front lines. The Shimazu withdrew and then assaulted from different angles, but Muren rebuffed these assaults 16 times. Under her, the defence of Surasaki was kept up with great energy, 
and during the main attack, they lost only one man who were taking 63 heads of the Shimazu attackers. The Shimazu had taken a lot of casualties and were low on supplies, but their commanders, when they had surrounded Murin, advised her to surrender, and she did. Don't worry, her story is far from over though. Her surrender had largely been a ruse. Over the following months, Murin gained the trust of the enemy commanders as she planned a rebellion. But there was to be a complication. Three months after her surrender, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who was attempting to unify Japan, was leading an army of 200,000 warriors their way. The Shimazu planned to retreat back to their original territory and defend from there, but Murin, having learned of Hideyoshi's invasion, told the Shimazu commanders that she had become too involved with their clan and couldn't stay at Surasaki Castle. Instead, she planned to accompany them away. Having earned their trust months ago, the Shimazu commanders believed her and left ahead of her, presumably expecting her to catch up at some point. And catch up she did, although probably not how they expected. After the Shimazu had left the castle, Miron gathered her troops and attacked them from behind, decimating them before launching another surprise attack on the Otozi River. It's reported that none of the Shimazu commanders survived. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who still planned to invade, had heard of her deeds and sent her an invitation to join his service, but she declined the offer and instead opted to return to a quiet life. Alright, I think I'll leave the video here. I don't think I covered everyone I said that I'll cover, but this script is getting a bit long and I can always come back to this topic. And yes, I know I didn't cover the more modern uh, Onabagaisha, specifically well, the last Onabagaisha who would become activists for female rights in Japan. Uh, I may cover them at another point, but this video is just getting a bit too long. So yeah, I think I'll just finish it here. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.